Hello, everyone, and welcome to our three-day virtual podcasting event called How to Make Real Money Podcasting. I am Ed Ryan, editor of Radio Inc. Magazine and the Podcast Business Journal. So, Dave, give us your best advice on, uh, obviously, we want to talk about making money, but uh, yeah. put together a good podcast, just like I asked with Marcus, what, what, you know, what are your first steps for people to, to get through so that they can, they can start sounding good and then you know, down the line, down the road there, worry about making money. Yeah. Samson Q2U is my go-to microphone. This is the, the Swiss army knife of podcasting, the zoom pod track B4. It's a recorder. It's a headphone amplifier. It's a USB interface. You can tie a phone into it. Everything you want to do, you can do on this little device. It's about the size of a checkbook. So that'll get you going. And that's about the price. You're, you're under the price of an Xbox at that point. And then you need a website. You do need a website. Why? Because Google needs to find you. So I, I recommend having your own website. And then from there, again, it really comes down to making great content and leaving enough time in your life to promote it. And that's where I always tell my clients, record like four or five episodes because there's a really good chance we're going to throw all those away anyway. I mean, the first time I picked up a guitar, I didn't go out and try to make money at it because I was awful. So record a couple. And so you can say, okay, this hour long podcast that I want to do, it's going to take me about, you know, whatever, six hours to, to put together. Okay. Can I do six hours three times a week? No, no, I can't. Can I do it twice a week? No. Can I do it once a week? Maybe. Can I do it twice a month? Absolutely. Whatever your schedule is, pick one that you can, can don't try to squeeze your, your podcast into your life. Uh, you know, try to make sure your life is there first and then squeeze that in there because that's really one of the key points. When you can be consistent, you are seen as reliable. When you deliver, wow, holy cow content, uh, about a block and a half from my house is a ice cream stand. I can go to Wendy's and get a frosty for about a buck 20. I will pay almost $4 for a single ice cream cone of Strickland's. Why? Because it's phenomenal. <laughs> so when you create that wow content, they're like, wow, I like this person. They keep giving me really good content. And so they, you're reliable, they like you. And then if you can ever, if you need to make a point, if you can share that with a personal story, they start to get to know you. So there's the old know you, like you, trust you. And when you say, Hey, I got a new book out. I got a new course. I got this, I got that. That's when they'll make money. From able to connect with thousands and thousands of women of color from all over the world. This year, we made a really big decision to close down our Facebook group and switch to a 100% paid model. So we have a paid community now. And that's going really, really well. With funding, we were able to hire a grants and opportunities coordinator, really pump up our job board and offer so many more resources that we couldn't have when we were just a free Facebook group. So it's going really, really well. So you, you, you figured out a way to make money at it. So you, what you did from the beginning was you started the Facebook group and, and then it grew kind of take us through the process of how it started. And then you got to a point where you figured, Hey, we can turn this into something where we make some money at it. Yeah. So we started off as a Facebook group and early on I was, I was really struggling with trying to fi figure out like a monetization model. I tried Patreon. I tried offering workshops. I tried offering like ticketed events and, and that was good, but it wasn't sustainable. And as we were growing the Facebook group, some concerns that we had was, you know, we're creating a safe space for women of color and we wanted the group to feel not super self promotionally. So we had to expand our team to hire, you know, to have more moderators who were all volunteering their time and effort. So after, you know, a couple of years of doing that, I said, we have to have to figure out a way to monetize so I could at least pay my, my pay my staff. So I, I made this idea to come up with a membership. And what I did is I pretty much looked at what are the things in the community that if I could, if I had the funding and the access that I could actually offer to my members. And I realized there were three things, accountability. There was also access to experts via classes and also just a smaller knit um, space. So I created those things and I put it up for sale and started off at $15 a month and, and, 
you know, I had a quite a bit of people who said yes. And I realized, okay, I think I have a business model. And that was over a year ago. So that really inspired me. That membership model inspired me to go ahead and eventually close down the Facebook group and create like a more closed uh, community aspect. So what platform did you use to do that? I, I, I must have missed that. Uh, I, I didn't. Could you do it on Facebook or did you find a different platform? Well, I'm just getting personally, I'm getting really tired of Facebook. And I know a yeah. lot of people feel that same way. So I was looking at things like Mighty Network and Circle. I really wanted a clo like a white label space where I can customize it without having, you know, a brand's uh, messaging on there. And also privacy was also a concern as well to go with circle after like, okay. you know, days and days of research. But I like that circle is white labeled and you can even embed it on your own website. So it's separate off of social media. You can control so many different aspects of it. There's still direct messaging features. So, so your folks can really build relationships amongst themselves. So that's the platform that uh, we went with. And I think the members really do love it. question for both of you is uh, why is it important to have a strong hosting company and why is it that uh, free isn't always the best way to go Ed, first of all thanks for uh, hosting us and uh, and inviting me on today to to discuss some podcasting topics you know i think it's a it's an interesting dilemma because what we see in the space today obviously with the uh, the introduction of anchor a few years ago this huge influx of people coming on to free platforms and oftentimes what happens is, is those folks go over there, they try something, it's, you know, maybe they stick with it, maybe they don't. But what has really shown over the years is free is not always often free. You may pay a price and some sort of functionality or something that you give up. But really the value in having a paid hosting company, you know, Rob and I both run podcast hosting companies. So, you know, we've got a little bit of vested interest in that is number one, tech support. You know, you can call a friend. You can ask for some help. You can uh, get advice when you need it. Also, you've got a true company that has a full-time staff behind that where if an issue comes up, some bug fix needs to be made. You know, really, that's what it's all about is the support and also helping shows getting build their shows and, and help shows grow by giving them uh, resources that they can use. And, of course, providing them tools that uh, are valuable and such that we're always looking to you know what the really the goal is of, of a podcaster is when they start their podcast is they want to grow their audience, whether it is to make money, whether it's to do some sort of business, uh, whether it is look to have something add to their current uh, lineup of social engagement, whatever it may be, everyone has a little bit different goal. So we are well served to help those content creators grow their podcast. And that's really their number one reason for often using a paid host is often we provide those services for them. Rob? Yeah, I mean, people will try to cut corners <laughs> in, in the craziest ways. Uh, they'll go out and spend a thousand dollars on a new equipment and and then go, oh, but I, I need to be on a free host and, and then spend all their time trying to troubleshoot and get their show up and running, where if they had just spent a little bit of money uh, they would have had a lot more time available to create new content. And then there's also the branding side of things, you know, uh, you know, with anchor, do you really want to be associated with the fact that there are more dead anchor shows on Apple podcasts than there are live and dead podcasts from everyone else on Apple podcasts. So there becomes a branding uh, thing there. If you're trying to really monetize your show, you want to show that you're serious about it. Um, and it's, it's like having an AOL email back in the day. Did, did that, is that really what you want to associate your, your business with? Um, but then again, as Todd mentioned, the support you're going to get from paid hosts are the reasons why Libsyn has been around since 2004 and we're still here. And there are people that have been hosting with us for over 15, 16 years, never had to move their show never had to worry about changing URLs, never had to worry about downtime. So these are things where as a podcaster, if you don't have to worry about the tech stuff, you can worry about the content and the monetization part. Mm -hmm.